I'm Ben Carlson, co-founder of Long Miles Coffee, and I want to talk to you about Burundi and the Burundi coffee sector kind of through the ages. Why should you listen to me? Well, because I've got 10 years of experience with Burundi quite intimately. My wife and co-founder of Long Miles, Christy, moved to Burundi in 2011. I started off as a coffee trader for an international coffee company, and really what we did was we traveled around the country visiting all the washing stations, 182 at the time, cupping coffee and trying to find the best coffee in the country. In 2013, we bought a side of a mountain and started Long Miles Coffee, um, producing coffee. We started a small model farm. And since then, we have grown Long Miles into three washing stations in Burundi, and we export coffee around the world to North America, Europe, Asia, Middle East, Australia, South Africa, and beyond. Other things that make me qualified was, well, our coffee did, um, was placed in the top of the Cup of Excellence when the competition was in Burundi, and I was also a juror when I was back as a coffee trader. So, Burundi, what's its history and what is it all about? The coffee history in Burundi really started when the Belgians were the colonizers and the rulers of Burundi back in the 20s and 30s. And this, what happened was is they had every single small holder, and they were actually peasants in this time, um, plant 50 coffee trees each throughout the whole country. So now, just to get a little idea what that's like, now there's a little over 11 million people living in Burundi and it's the size of Maryland so and most of these people are rural and so that puts the population density kind of on the same level as India for rural density so you got these 11 million people each back then it was closer to 6 million people that were each planting 50 coffee trees each coffee farmer today has between one and two acres of land maximum but back then they had a little bit more, but 50 trees was still a lot. So now, through the 20s, 30s, the Belgians were ruling. By 1962, now Burundi became an independent state. And at that point, the, you'd think that the coffee would just be free and everybody would either get excited about it, but really they'd been, it had been underneath colonial rule for so long that a lot of the interest in coffee waned. So by the time the 1970s came along, 1972 exactly, the, the country kind of recaptured the coffee sector and nationalized it. And what they did was they formed Soja Stalls, which is Societe du Gestation du Station du Popage Lavage. So these Soja Stalls are the wet mills or wet processing centers for the community because there's no single farmer in Burundi, even today, that has its own estate. So through the 70s and up through the 80s was kind of the heyday, the beautiful mass production of coffee in Burundi and so really the peak production was kind of mid to late 80s and that really started falling away because as the 90s came a lot of civil unrest started happening kind of all through the 90s into the early 2000s there was civil war unrest assassinations of presidents and the coffee sector suffered terribly so in 93 even, in fact, there was a coffee embargo, so you couldn't even export the coffee except by uh, flight, really. So this, is, this really just shattered the coffee industry, yeah, coffee industry. So now jump forward a little bit, and now you're getting into the early 2000s. And the early 2000s, the coffee sector started to, they, the country saw that there was no way they could keep the coffee sector going. So with, they, with the help of the World Bank, Burundi started to privatize the coffee sector. And now was the first time that coffee companies around the world could start to get single, single washing station coffees. So that was in 2009. So in 2009, all of a sudden, a big grant from the World Bank kind of moved all of the, they were supposed to privatize all of the washing stations, selling off all these 182 stations. But what really happened was only about half of them were sold, and this was, they were still called these soja stalls. So you have this combination now, in from 2009 on, of government-controlled soja stall stations. You have this cooperatives that have now started, um, run by Kokoka, and now you've got this private 
stations are able to come in. And one of the biggest players was Sukafina, um, that has its Washington's bought about 30 stations along with their sister company, Grinco. And then there's some private Burundian operators that started growing, building their own station. And that's when we moved to the country, saw the opportunity, saw the, the, the beautiful coffee, the wonderful potential, and decided that we would build our own washing station in about 2013. So through all of this, you can see that the farmers have been um, just kind of really not invested into. And so now you've got these farmers, most of which have 200 coffee trees per farmer, but have less than an acre of land per individual farmer. And one of the things that really makes it hard on these Burundian farmers is that each year, Burundi loses almost 38 million tons of soil and 4% of its GDP because of land degradation. So all this is to say that the small holders are reliant on these central washing stations to produce their coffee. Now, present day, what's happened? From 2019, 2020, 2021 has been the worst three years of coffee production in Burundi's life because of that land degradation. In 2019, Burundi had 20% of its total production. 2020 and 2021, this present harvest, we've only seen 50% of Burundi's harvest actually realized. So, what does that mean? It means less coffee, but I would have to say Burundi's got some of the tastiest coffee and David can explain a little bit more of that. Hi, and welcome to Leaderboard. My name is David Stallings and today I'm going to talk to you about tasting Burundi coffees. For the past three years I've had the privilege of working with Long Miles Coffee and though Long Miles is expanding into Kenya and Uganda, for the past eight years our focus has been on our work in Burundi where we own three washing stations. My job title with Long Miles is Roaster Relations, which is primarily a sales job. But another big part of my work with Long Miles focuses on the quality of our coffee. In this regard, I get to interact directly with our washing station managers on things such as production protocol and drying, uh, our head of quality in Burundi on these items and also you know dry mill scheduling. And another big part of my job focuses on lot creation. Much of the coffee that comes off the drying tables in our washing stations, uh, the lots are very small, smaller than one bag, sometimes even down to 10 kilograms of coffee. Uh, and I get the privilege of combining these lots to make them a, a, a size that can be milled and a size that can be exported. This uh, part of my job has become increasingly important uh, during life under a global pandemic. This is our second season in a row in which we could not send our lab manager to Burundi due to COVID. As such, every single day lot sample has come to my lab here in Pennsylvania and has been tasted here by me. This means that over the last 15 months or so, I've tasted literally thousands of Burundi lots. And I think this makes me qualified to be your instructor today. Before we talk about Burundi specifically, I want to talk about the Great Lakes region generally. Uh, the Great Lakes region of East Africa is defined or dominated by uh, t you know, roughly 10 uh, relatively sizable lakes in East Africa, some of these being quite impressive in size. Uh, lake Victoria, for example, is the second largest freshwater lake in the world by area. Uh, lake Tanganyika, which Burundi butts up against, is the second largest freshwater lake in the world by volume of water and by depth. It's also the longest lake in the world. So these are some pretty sizable uh, lakes. And there's a number of countries that are surrounding these lakes, and some of them are prominent coffee producing countries, uh, including the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and of course, Burundi. Uh, so there are other coffee producing countries that are technically uh, Great Lakes region countries, but to me, those are the five you know, most important from a specialty coffee perspective. There is a flavor profile that to me, uh, you know, kind of is present in all of these countries. Uh, and that is, it has to do with the bittering base character of the coffees. So 
When we talk about bitter, you know, that word often is used in a negative context. But bitter isn't, you know, negative in and of itself, right? Like, a lot of things that are uh, excellent are bitter. Chocolate is bitter. Um, you know, uh, hops is, are bitter, you know, which a lot of beers are bitter. Uh, and coffee is bitter. Uh, bitter is only bad or is only, you know, used in a negative con uh, connotation uh, by coffee professionals around a cupping table when it is the dominating or an out-of-balance feature of the coffee. But if the bitterness is in balance with the sweetness and the acidity, uh, you know, it's, it is part and parcel of the coffee. It's, it's part of the nature of the coffee. So to me, coffees tend to have one of two types of bittering base. They tend to be more cocoa-like, uh, you know, and this can be uh, from, you know, very um, bittersweet chocolate to milk chocolatey, or they tend to be black tea-like. Uh, and, you know, they're not 100% mutually exclusive. It's not to say a coffee can't have chocolatey and tea-like character to it, but I will say that I, I find those to be the exception. And generally speaking, I think coffees either tend to be more of a bittering black tea base or of a cocoa base. Uh, and the coffees from the Great Lakes region I associate with a bittering black tea base. So we're going to narrow our focus now. We we're just talking about the Great Lakes region. Now I, I, we're not quite going to talk about just Burundi, but I want to talk about Rwanda and Burundi. So Rwanda is the northern neighbor of Burundi. And I think these two countries have a lot in common in terms of flavor profile. Uh, and I also think they share some pretty unique flavors in the coffee producing world. Um, most importantly, uh, there's a flavor that they share that is a result of a, a baking spice aromatics combining with a molasses type of sweetness that they coalesce to create this, this flavor that is almost like clay. And, and that sounds negative. And I used to describe it as kind of clean earth, but I shied away from that because that, that's a term that not a lot of specialty coffee people want to hear applied to coffee. Uh, and I get that. Uh, I, some people like earthy flavors in their coffee. Um, I don't, and a lot of specialty coffee people don't. But this isn't earthy in a, a dirt sense. This is earthy in a clay sense. Uh, and a couple years ago, I was tasting some uh, Italian red wines with a good friend of mine who's a smaye, and a term that they were using uh, over and over again was terracotta. And something just clicked in me that that was exactly the flavor that I get in Rwandan and Burundi coffees. This clean earth that's related to spice and this unprocessed or raw kind of sugar with molasses in it character. They, again, they coalesce to create this flavor that to me is like terracotta. Uh, so I think that's a flavor that's very unique to these two countries, not exclusive to, but I would say very prominent in these two countries. Another flavor that is not exclusive to these two countries, but I do get very prominently in these two countries, is uh, a sweet hay or a straw character. So that may be another uh, descriptor that doesn't sound particularly pleasant to some people. Much like the terracotta, it is, to me, a very enjoyable, very clean flavor. It is not at all anywhere on the unclean or dirty side of things. Uh, and in fact, if you uh, ever have had experience smelling fresh cut hay or uh, straw that is recently dried or is still relatively fresh and isn't mildewy or anything like that, it's a lovely smell, very sweet. Uh, almost floral, but not uh, existing in this territory that's kind of toasty, but not cereally or grainy. Uh, again, on this spectrum to floral, but not flowery. Uh, I think it's a very unique character that I get in these coffees. Uh, I will say, much like the dichotomy in bittering base between cocoa and black tea, I tend to get, co in lightly roasted coffees, and this gets obfuscated in darker, uh, you know, coffees that have more roast artifact to them, um, I get another dichotomy that is between wafer cookie and this sweet hay character that I'm talking about. 
So again, I don't get this in more medium to darkly roasted coffees, but in lightly roasted coffees, uh, some of them will present a wafer cookie-like character, and here I'm thinking Ethiopian coffees, for example, um, Colombian coffees can have this character to them, uh, Guatemalan coffees can have this character to them, and then in other coffees, I will get more of a sweet hay or a straw-like character, and to me, uh, Great Lakes region coffees, but really specifically Rwanda and Burundi, can really have this really pleasant sweet hay or straw-like character to them. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Burundi coffee specifically. So, in truth, I do think of Burundi in a relatively homogenous way. I don't experience a lot of difference in Burundi from region to region within Burundi. Um, you know, you take a country like Colombia, and there can be quite variation from producing region to producing region, or ditto Ethiopia. Um, but I think it's important to keep something in mind, and that's the fact that uh, Burundi is very, very small. Uh, for perspective, Burundi is 2.5% the size Colombia. I mean, that's it's very, very, very tiny. You know, I, I live in the States, on the East Coast, in the state of Pennsylvania which is uh, an average size state in the states. I believe it's the 33rd largest state in the states out of 50. And Burundi is roughly one quarter the size of the state that I live in. So, I mean, it's a very, very tiny country. Uh, to add to this is the fact that, for the most part, it's a pretty homogenous gene pool in terms of what, what copy is being produced. You know, uh, according to the Burundi government, it is all strictly Bourbon, heirloom Bourbon that's being grown in Burundi. Uh, most people believe this is not 100% true. There's very likely some Tipica genetics in there. But for the most part, uh, there's when you go to buy coffee plants in Burundi, or coffee seed rather, there's two options. And you're told they're both Bourbon and the government controls this, and that's what's being propagated all over the country. So it's a relatively homogenous gene pool in a very, very small country. So it's not incredibly surprising that the flavor profiles throughout Burundi uh, are fairly similar. Uh, there are some regions that are slightly lower elevation that uh, have similar uh, flavor profiles, but uh, maybe slightly nuttier character due to the lower elevation. Um, and, you know, nutty is an interesting flavor. Earlier I was talking about this dichotomy between wafer co cookie and uh, sweet hay or straw. Uh, to me, nutty is actually kind of on that plane of flavor, but only in lower quality coffees or I mean, that's not, that puts down a lot of coffees in the world, and that's certainly not what I'm trying to do, but it's a very specific flavor profile that you don't get in really high-grown, high-quality coffees from, you know, Burundi. Uh, so, lower elevation, yes, you can get those flavors, um, but to me, the wafer cookie, uh, sweet hay spectrum is kind of uh, a quality level above nutty at light roasts, if that makes sense. Um, so, also, there are some regions that are slightly drier uh, year-round, generally speaking, and those regions, uh, to me, express the same flavor profiles that you get from the regions such as Kayanza uh, and Morambia that are really known for producing high-quality specialty coffee, but just slightly less intense, and we're going to talk about what those flavor profiles are right now. So. To recap, okay, Great Lakes region coffees, we got a black tea bittering base. Okay, focusing in just on Burundi and Rwanda, uh, we're getting this kind of terracotta flavor that is very, very clean uh, and can be very subtle, uh, but I notice it in almost all Burundi coffees. Uh, and then we also get this sweet hay like character. Uh, also can be very subtle, but again, I noticed it, I noticed it in almost all high quality Burundi coffees. Uh, I would add to this a molasses-like sweetness, and in fact, that should be added kind of more to the Great Lakes region character. That's, I think, pervades most of those coffees. Um, and that kind of covers where we're at up until now, Burundi-specific. 
to me, the, the best Burundi coffees fall into one of two general categories, okay? And before I get into those categories, I want to say I've cupped quite a few Burundi coffees, and in my experience, these categories don't necessarily have to do with where exactly in Burundi the coffee is coming from. The same hills, a hill is the smallest geopolitical unit in Burundi, and what we at Long Miles uh, separate our micro lots by. The same hills can produce, in my experience, both of these types of coffees. So I don't know if that's a climactic thing, I don't know if it is uh, a processing thing, I don't know, I don't know what exactly it is that decides which of these flavor profiles dominate, but I do, I will taste these flavors from the same hills. Um, I will generally speaking say that sometimes I know a hill to be more dominantly producing one of these two categories that I'm going to talk about in a second than the other, but it's, it hasn't become so clear to me yet that certain areas exclusively produce or, or more dominantly produce one of the flavor profiles over the other. So uh, to talk directly about these flavor profiles, the first one is similar to a, the best Rwandan coffees, but then takes things a bit further. Uh, so they'll have a very nice citric acidity. They'll have a nice red fruit component that can be a very refined and clear fresh raspberry note. Um, they can, in to me, what are the best iterations, have a, an herbal character that is not at all vegetal, but is more hops-like and floral and adds a very nice depth uh, and complexity to the coffee uh, while being and remaining very, very clean. Uh, they can even have a red current like acidity to them. Uh, and these can be very vibrant coffees, very lively coffees. Um, and again, I've tasted Rwandan coffees that uh, have similar profiles, but it seems to me that the, the best Burundi lots that I've tasted that have these characters uh, have a depth of flavor and a depth of sweetness and complexity of acidity that uh, does go beyond what I've tasted from Rwanda. And that may be me showing my ignorance in the subtleties of Rwandan coffees, because I've certainly had plenty of Rwandan coffees that I absolutely love. It's not me putting down Rwanda by any stretch of the imagination. The other flavor profile that I find to be just the, the peak of potential in Burundi is a flavor profile that has this black tea bittering base, it has a molasses-like sweetness, it has a sweet hay character, but then it has a black currant-like acidity uh, reminiscent of a Kenyan coffee. Um, it doesn't have the intense piquancy of a Kenyan coffee, um, but actually that fact to me makes it almost more enjoyable because it can be so in balance and so refined, um, and it has this great sweetness that's molasses-like, but the black currant-like acidity that can even border on blackberry-like acidity uh, informs you know, the perceived sweetness of the coffee in such a way that it makes them just so juicy uh, and so sweet and so lovely. Um, and these also can have a slight floral character to them. Uh, that it's it's a pretty unbeatable combination of flavors. They're they're really lovely coffees. So everything we've talked about so far was in relation to washed coffees. Uh, the reason this is true is because generally speaking, it's easier to taste the taste of uh, a place and a time that a coffee was produced in washed processed coffees. Uh, Burundi does, and Long Miles does, however, produce uh, honey processed coffees and naturally processed coffees as well. So uh, I'll touch on honey process in a second. First, let's talk about naturally processed coffees. So as many of you watching this video will know, naturally processed coffees uh, sometimes are put down by specialty coffee professionals. Uh, and the reason for this has to do with the very nature of this conversation, actually, which is the fact that they can obfuscate the flavors and cover up the flavors of the, the place that a coffee was created. Um, 
We produce naturals. We absolutely love our naturals. Uh, our customers, uh, the roasters who buy them and their customers seem to absolutely love our naturals. Uh, we have absolutely nothing wrong with producing naturally processed coffees. But I did want to note that because it is going to make talking about the naturally processed coffees a much shorter process here. Uh, you know, by nature of the processing, with a naturally processed coffee, you're letting the fruit dry completely on the seeds, which are, of course, what we roast and grind and brew as coffee. By nature of the process, there's much more fruit character in naturally processed coffees. Uh, to, to add to this, Burundi can be quite wet during harvest. Drying naturally processed coffees is a challenge even in dry climates, but especially when you add rain into this, it can be very, very challenging to do it in a clean way because you want to really drive off a lot of the moisture very quickly. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get natural fermentation happening inside the fruit itself, and, you know, just by nature of the fact that it's less yeast inside of there and more bacteria inside the fruit itself because uh, it's easier for bacteria due to its smaller size to get through the, the you know, protective layer, the skin of the, the coffee fruit. You get more bacteria in there and so you're more likely to have bacterial fermentation or bacteria dominated fermentation, which produces more uh, if it becomes more uh, prominent or extended, it produces more acetic character, which is, uh, you know, s flavors such as apple cider vinegar. Um, and for most specialty coffee professionals, this is to be avoided. And so it's really important to dry naturally processed coffees very, very quickly. And again, this can be challenging because the rainy season can be a challenge, or sorry, the, the production season can still be rainy in Burundi or can have occasional rain showers. And so a producer has to be very nimble in Burundi. They have to be able to say it's not the appropriate weather to produce naturals right now or they or and or they have to be able to have a good protocol in place for covering the drying beds that have naturals on them when it is raining, uncovering them when it's not raining, make sure you're rotating the coffees well, etc. All that to say, if you're able to do that well, and if you're able to produce naturals well in Burundi, you're, you're rewarded greatly. Um, of course, they are very fruity. You know, of course, they have a very, uh, you know, red fruit forward character that is often strawberry-like. In the best iterations, it's, it's clean and not at all a rotten strawberry character. But then they also still have this very nice, black tea-like base and molasses-like sweetness that I think makes them very unique among East African naturally processed coffees and naturally processed coffees in general. So it is, it's significant, significantly harder to um, detect a naturally processed Burundi coffee on a table of naturally processed coffees when you're cupping. Uh, it's much easier, in my opinion, to notice or point out or detect a washed Burundi coffee amongst washed East African coffees or washed coffees in general. But this is going to be true for almost any origin that you're tasting. Um, so as far as honey processed coffees go, over the years we've actually produced a lot less honey processed coffee. And this has to do with, uh, to be honest, predominantly the, the palates of myself and Ben, the, the, one of the founders of Long Miles. Um, we've just been less enthused by these coffees. Uh, you know, when you produce a washed processed coffee, you're removing the skin, some of the mucilage, you're fermenting that, and then you're washing it off. There's fermentation there that's absolutely affecting the flavor of the coffee. When you're producing a naturally processed coffee, you're picking the fruit, there's fermentation happening within the fruit itself. You know, hopefully it's a controlled fermentation from the perspective that you're drying it quickly, like I just mentioned, but nonetheless, there is some fermentation happening there in the fruit, and that adds to the complexity and to the flavor of the coffee. And of course, so does the mucilage drying on the seeds themselves. But a honey processed coffee lives in this in-between territory. It's being pulped, but then it's being dried very quickly. Uh, and this is my hypothesis, but I believe that you're not getting the complexity from the fermentation of a wash processed coffee, nor are you getting the complexity from the fermentation that's happening naturally within, uh, within inside the fruit of a naturally processed coffee. And what you get left with is they can be very, very clean coffees, but they just have 
what are the more generic identifying features that we've talked about. They will just be predominantly tea-like and at most have some terracotta character to them and not much else. So this is what I noticed from some different processing methods in Burundi. Um, I'd be super interested to hear if other people out there have had different experiences tasting Burundi coffees uh, with processes different than washed coffee. And then the final thing I want to talk about, and I'll be quick about it, and this is going back to the Great Lakes uh, generally, is the potato defect. The potato defect is very unique to the Great Lakes region coffees. Uh, it is especially prominent in Rwanda and Burundi, and it is a taste defect that, to be honest, we're not entirely certain the roots of. We, we understand some factors that contribute to the likelihood of its uh, occurrence, um, but I'm not going to dive into that right now. That's beyond the scope of this talk. But the important thing is, what the potato taste defect is, is when you grind or you can even smell it in the whole bean sometime, a coffee from Rwanda or Burundi or other Great Lakes region coffees that have the potato taste defect, it, the aroma of the coffee is very, very, very similar to a raw potato. I mean, incredibly similar. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the coffee from the perspective of it's not gonna hurt you in any way. It's not uh, bad to drink it, but most people do choose to just dump it out purge them some more coffee through their grinder to clean that out, and then regrind some new coffee. Uh, the potato taste defect is, we've gotten a lot better at reducing the occurrence of it. This past year, uh, I don't have the data yet from this current harvest, but in 2020, uh, it happened in around 2.5% of the cups that I tasted out of thousands of cups. Uh, when I first started buying Burundi coffee about 10 years ago, I was happy if it was less than 20% of the cups that I was tasting. So we've gotten a lot better as an industry and I feel really great about where Long Miles is at with potato taste defect, but it does happen. And that's important to know because uh, if you are doing leaderboard and you're trying to figure out if it's a Great Lakes region coffee and there's potato taste uh, defect in it, you'll know it's not a coffee from Central or South America, for example, or even Ethiopia or Kenya. So uh, I hope this talk has been really helpful for you in tasting uh, not only Burundi, but uh, other coffees from the region. Uh, I feel really strongly that Burundi has so much quality and so much unique uh, character to it, and that it's such a wonderful producing country. And I'm so glad uh, to be a part of Leaderboard, and I'm so glad that Burundi coffees get to be a part of Leaderboard. Thank you so much.